Um, I do believe that digital security is uh, not only supposed to be something that you think about um, as an afterthought, but something that can be worked into every aspect of uh, not only your, your professional life, but even your personal life. Um, increasingly, uh, our personal lives uh, collide with our professional lives in ways that uh, are less escapable than they were, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, so for instance, um, a lot of people don't necessarily understand the impact of, you know, their social media and how they use that increasingly for promotion, um, not only of their own personal work, but of the projects that they're associated with. Uh, how even like, you know, producers and other people um, are surrounding a project might actually ask them to do that type of promotion on their on behalf of the project, but using, you know, the social media activity of, you know, the person themselves. And that's just one example. Um, so uh, also, I believe that, you know, digital security, uh, if you apply it, you know, evenly across your entire life, um, can actually make you way more effective at securing projects that, you know, have more sensitivity than you even thought. That was Harlow Holmes from the Freedom of the Press Foundation, where she is the Chief Information Security Officer and Director of Digital Security. Harlow works with journalists and media organizations to help make the digital space safer for them and their work. She's also contributed to The Guardian Project, a collaborative open source project that develops secure apps for users all over the world. This is a Dispatch episode from the International Journalism Festival in Perugia, Italy. We got to ask Harlow about some really complex but common issues journalists face and what they can do to prevent and navigate them. Here's our chat. Journalists sometimes feel like they need to self-censor when they're being mobbed or trolled or attacked for covering a topic. Is this a rising trend? It's something that we do see. Um, I wouldn't say often, thankfully, but it's increasingly um, become an issue. And depending on, you know, whose feathers you ruffle, as they say, uh, it uh, can be more in, uh, yeah, more impactful in like a very, very negative way that leads people to self-censor themselves. Um, not only self-censor themselves, but uh, actually just leave the field and stop telling stories entirely because it does become so personally um, harming uh, that people no longer feel that it's worth it to continue tell, to tell stories if they're going to have to face that type of harassment. Yes. Um, and we do see that it has become like really effective um, for people who are like either like uh, yeah nas retaliating against somebody because they're nationalistic or uh, simply retaliating against someone because they're saying something on the opposite side of the political spectrum um, these are kind of different things uh, even though they tend to be intertwined um, or saying something because they just like don't like them and they want to just uh, harass them out of existence but whatever the person's ideolo ideology is when they start to attack uh, thankfully uh, the the majority of the methods that you can take to protect yourself are the same. How did you start working on digital security for journalists? Yeah, um, well, uh, I mean, I'm a big consumer of media, first and foremost, and a huge advocacy uh, for press freedom um, and always have been. Uh, I love and admire the storytellers who are telling the stories. Uh, but that said, uh, I got started um, primarily as a, a developer um, and a security professional and definitely did notice that, uh, you know, when we were training people to use tools, uh, there were so many gaps that needed to be filled regarding people's like, you know, uh, the people's security on the very devices that they use um, and the way that they use those devices. So for instance, uh, an engineer can build an excellent piece of software that is like designed so perfectly, you know, as perfect as things can be to keep you safe. But if you're using it on a device that is 
riddled with malware or um, where you don't understand exactly like why um, you know your privacy is also integral to this particular piece of software working successfully, then you still are set up to fail. And I felt that there are so many amazing engineers out there uh, who do work I admire so much. Um, but rather than tear my hair out trying to write the best piece of code, um, I felt that I personally would have uh, more use um, just helping people bridge the gap between, you know, like our uh, common misconceptions about how devices should be used and the tools that will keep them safer and make them more effective at their job. And I felt that there was like a gap in our ecosystem that I could better fill. If someone is facing online harassment or their identity has been stolen, the first instinct is panic because they don't know what they are dealing with. Is there an approach you would recommend for these initial moments? Uh, well, one is uh, knowing that people are not alone at all. Um, and increasingly, this is so common. People are going to have different reactions and they're going to need different things to feel better. And I can't really say whether, you know, the best tact is to uh, literally like turn off your computer, or check your phone into the sea. Uh, that might be the appropriate response for some people. Um, or if it is to, you know, like um, steal yourself up and actually go in there and battle it, even though you're a, a, in a very, very vulnerable and frightened place and anything in between. Um, but uh, I think the best thing that people can do is uh, be in a position uh, to make sure that they have access to like the right resources to help them figure out what the right path is for them and to help them pick through, you know, like the various options in order to get through it. Um, there is a saying that like, uh, what is it? Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. and. Uh, what we train people to do is to establish baselines, healthy baselines, meaning, you know, to give an example, uh, you're way more prepared to go into fighting an online harassment campaign um, if you know that there are, you know, like certain privacy settings within your platforms that you could turn on and off uh, depending on how safe you feel to be online. Um, if you are in the face of, let's say, uh, an attempt for somebody to take over your accounts and log into your Facebook account or something like that, know that there are settings that allow you to be notified if something is weird. Um, and also, uh, you already know which devices you own are already logged into your Facebook. So if something else appears, you know automatically that that is um, outside of the baseline. Um, and since you already established a baseline, it's easier for you to like respond with a clear head. So those are the things that we like to empower people to do. Do you think it is better to approach digital security and safety as a team sport or an individual sport, especially in newsrooms? I like that you put it that way. And actually, um, I think that it's both. Uh, the reason why it's both is because uh, the media ecosystem is one where nowadays uh, people are once again required to leverage their social media um, and their personal you know digital life in order to augment what their organization um, needs to do in order to promote stories and to promote you know their talent um, and for some reason we've all decided as an industry that that was entirely fair um, and people do it uh, people even feel compelled to do it, even if they're uncomfortable with it. And so, uh, given the fact that, you know, my Twitter account, your Twitter accounts, whatever, are going to have been started, um, like, way before you even thought you might have gotten into this industry, and will follow you along your career path as you move from organization to project to other organization to project, it belongs to you. And there's really only so much that an, uh, an employer can do um, in order to, yeah, to, to maintain that. And so, unfortunately, there is like a certain responsibility that individuals have to take because that is media property that belongs solely to them. But it is also a team sport. 
uh, because knowing that and knowing that organizations um, insist so much upon, uh, you know, this um, weird, uh, you know, mixture between like the personal and the professional at all times, they do have a responsibility to provide as much support as they possibly can um, in order to uh, lessen the friction when people do get into trouble in their individual digital lives. So it's both. For journalists that don't have a support system, how can they improve their digital security without having to invest a lot of time into it? That's a really good question. Um, I do think that, uh, well, one, you know, uh, this type of security does not have to be incredibly hard or onerous or time consuming. And people can, you know, make improvements bit by bit by bit whenever they find the time to do so. And quite frankly, a lot of the recommendations that um, my organization and organizations like PEN America and, um, you know, like the IWMF recommend uh, actually do not take so much out of one's day if you want to just like kind of get started. So no one should feel intimidated about you know how much time it's it will actually take to get to a uh, like a good standard of security uh, but that said uh, it's a good idea and this is this comes back to your team sport idea uh, for organizations to um, help people allocate their time by making it as manageable and also conveying the fact that it doesn't have to be incredibly hard uh, two ideas that you know come out is uh, one you know like uh, if people in an organization whose job it is to uh, worry about people's security, uh, communicate like you know on a very like sparse but regular basis what people should look out for, what they should have taken care of, and like boil it down to like a, a checklist that people can like take care of during you know like an hour. Um, that would be fine. And also um, upon like uh, certain events like onboarding when you join an organization offboarding when a project is over, um, going, for instance, in a documentary film cycle, looking at, you know, the initial um, research that you do, then looking at the situation once again during production, then looking at it again in post-production, then looking at it again when you go on the conference circuit. Um, having specific times um, that you schedule in a calendar that allow people to take care of that uh, those items on the checklist um, without feeling that they're you know like volunteering their own personal time, but rather making that part of you know the work that they have to do for part for that project, would be really generous and beneficial. How can digital threats manifest in the physical world? So yeah, how does the digital manifest itself physically? Um, for a variety of reasons, so much of our physical, you know, like uh, our physical presences on this planet are intertwined in the digital artifacts that we leave. And that means that, you know, um, I don't know, people might recognize the background of this uh, particular footage and say, hmm, I'll bet that, you know, we are in Perugia right now in this very, very specific spot. That's um, not, you know, like a so far fetched of, of, of a thing to expect. So that's like one example of how watching a piece of media on the Internet could then like point to a physical location on Earth. Then there's stuff that, you know, we don't see. Um, things like the fact that, you know, all of our phones are emanating so much data, whether it's talking to cell phone towers or it's uh, when we check in on Facebook or, you know, we tweet something on Twitter, where all of that information in aggregate can paint not only a picture of where I am, but where all of us are, you know, together as a network. Um, and under you know certain circumstances and in you know like the hands of people who do not have your well your best wishes at heart that can be pretty damaging um and so uh when it becomes the most scary and actually did you ever see the movie the ring where uh right so uh you know they think it's a videotape yeah. right and you know we'll watch this videotape but then uh during like one of the final scenes sorry spoiler alert um <laughs> 
the uh, the ghost character actually like crawls out of the television set and is like immediately like in front of the guy and um, yeah and and she is physically there to harm him and so when we think of uh, you know uh, online harassment campaigns that includes things like doxing meaning finding out you know what your favorite cafe is so far it's over there, um, you know, or uh, finding out like where you live or where your, you know, best friend lives or something like that and actually like has, you know, uh, it's set in their head to go after you in physical, physical space. Um, that is exactly that moment when, you know, you can think of like, you know, what you think is behind a screen actually jumping out into your physical world. Um, and we need to work so hard in order to protect that. Um, that means protecting our data, protecting our privacy, um, understanding how to respond, uh, what's appropriate, um, and what's most urgent if we are under threat of, happen of that happening, um, and also lobbying for more control, uh, you know, legally and also within the platforms and also with developers and stuff like that who make these tools uh, to make it less likely that someone who does not wish you well can actually jump out of the screen like that. What can journalists do to stay vigilant and not get demoralized by threats including undetected ones like the Pegasus hacks? Um, I do feel that people are way more willing to uh, keep themselves safer if you uh, give them ways to empower themselves rather than to scare themselves. Um, and this is also where preparedness comes into play. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, uh, because there is such a uh, like line between the digital and the physical, um, think about what you do physically, right? We get checkups, right? We, um, you know, uh, brush your teeth, you know, um, this is pretty much the same as like keeping sure our software is up to date, keeping, uh, making sure that uh, we are aware of like, you know, sweeping changes to privacy policies in the platforms that we use and no longer expect that, you know, Facebook plays by the same rules today as they did 10 years ago. Um, and I think that uh, if people you know like want to stay empowered you can challenge them to do that um, and do it when uh, you know when on their own clip on their own schedule rather than do it under duress then that goes a very very long way um, but ultimately when you did mention you know things like Pegasus and by the way like that's just the one whose name we know right yeah. there like there could be a bajillion Pegasuses out there right um, there uh, compartmentalization goes a long way there um, so uh, and this com this means different things from a personal perspective than it does from a pro professional perspective um, but uh, you probably do want to uh, think around you know your relationship to devices um, in a way that should something happen to one specific compartment in your entire workflow then it's less of a blow to an overall project or to your safety or to your secure or your your privacy than if you all had it out there like you know just in the same bin you know actually uh, if you want to think about a um, uh, the correlate, it's like, you know, uh, it's best to clean your room um, so you know where things are. What is a good starting point to do a risk assessment? So initial risk assessments, um, yeah. Uh, so the way that we usually teach risk assessments uh, is challenging because it's a lot of like, jargon coming from like the security world and we're trying to put that in people's hands um, and unlike in security uh, like with computers and stuff like that security as far as like individuals are concerned um, like takes a lot of translation in order for it to make sense to us as people but um, we boil it down to roughly five questions and the first one is what is it that you have to protect 
And this could be anything from, you know, like uh, the contents of your phone, your text messages, um, you know, uh, your mom's phone number, uh, like a password, anything like that. Um, and then who do you have to protect it from? And so, you know, perhaps like, um, I don't know, a corporation, uh, if I were investigating them, doesn't really want to know my mom's phone number because why would they? Uh, but perhaps a troll on the internet who wants to harass me um, would want to try to terrorize my mom just because they know that that would make me really, really, really upset. Um, so uh, once you decide from whom these assets are important to, then you might ask yourself, uh, what are the implications uh, and where, you know, with the, between the personal and the professional, do these implications lie? Uh, is it going to make me uh, like really uh, uncomfortable going onto, you know, uh, Instagram today uh, if, uh, you know, there was a certain type of harassment? Or is it going to jeopardize the project if you know that same harassment were supposed to occur? Um, and then you kind of take stuff. You look at that room. You walk into your room and you look at the mess and you say, "Okay, um, I'm now kind of in a position to sort things into appropriate places within this, you know, like room um, where I can handle how to." Uh, protect them based off of where they live in that room using the resources that I have, which is how much time do I have, um, perhaps some, how much money uh, it would cost to do that, and ultimately like how much skill I have or the, um, the people in my like, network have that you know, can help me raise myself to the level of security that just covers what I need to do to move on.